so the 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 topic that I'm uh, I'm going to share about tonight is why does God allow born again believers uh, to suffer? Um, and I don't know about many of you, but I when when I first became a born again believer, um, I, I kind of thought all my problems were over. <laughs> You know, when I first got born again, God backed up a dump truck full of uh, of spiritual gifts and and blessings, and um, I experienced a tremendous period of of success and and favor, and and I thought, wow, this is going to be the way it goes all the way to eternity, and and as it turns out, that wasn't the case. That um, you know, uh, there, there were many hardships still to come. And so it left me wondering, it's like, well, why, if, if Christ paid for my sins, then, then why, why am I experiencing suffering and, and, uh, loss? And so that's what I want to talk about, uh, tonight is, why doesn't God just take us out and away from all of this suffering and and despair? Um, and so, how, how many of you? Uh, and just unmute and, and and let me know how many of you have you have ever heard the saying, "God won't give you more than you can handle." Has that, has anybody else heard that idiom? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I I was wondering what chapter and verse uh, that was in the Bible, and guess what? It there is no chapter and verse because that that idiom does not come from the Bible. And when when people have said that to me in the past, hey, God won't give you more than you can handle. I was like, oh, really? Um, how about cancer? Is is cancer more than you can handle? It, it's more than I can handle. Um, how about death? You know, God brings death. Uh, you know, people die. Is that more than somebody can handle? Uh, I think unquestionably. Um, what about prodigal children? You know, you hope the best for your your children, and then they go off and make stupid decisions. And and you know, um, what about cheating? Spouses or or divorce, bankruptcy, uh, job loss, inflation, wars, crime. Are those more are are those more than you can handle? Um, in in some case, I would say yes. That is more than you can handle. And so it begs the question: then, if 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 Christ paid for my sins, then then why am I paying? You know why am I being punished? What? What? Why the the why the loss? Why the suffering? Why the sickness? The disease? That um, you know shouldn't shouldn't we be past that now that we're we're born again Christian? Well, uh, what I like to do is is take you uh, first to Second Corinthians uh, chapter one. Uh, and I don't know if I can share my screen here, but I'm going to, I'm going to try. Uh, I'm, I'm bringing up, uh, ESORD and, uh, let's just go to, to second Corinthians. Um, so this sounds like they were given more than they could handle. Um, and these are born again Christians. These are, these are the founders of the church. Um, and I don't know how many of you have ever contemplated when you go through trouble, you know, thoughts of, is God mad at me? Have I lost favor with God? Is, um, have I, have I angered the Holy Spirit? Well, these are the founders of the church. And I would suggest to you that when you suffer these things, it, quite the contrary is true. Um, and, and that's what I, that, that's what I, what I really want to press upon this evening is that, that when we go through hardship, um, we, we're participating 
in the exercise of faith. Um, since I'm in Esau here, let's let's just uh, let's shoot on over to Job, Job chapter three, and and if if, if you're familiar with the the story of Job. Job lost everything. He he lost his his family members. He lost his cattle. He lost his servants and his barns and his land. And he lost everything. And then he got sick uh, and had boils and everything else. But this is something that this this is somebody that uh, that God was bragging on Lucifer to so much so that that he made an example of Job so that Job participated in the demonstration of his faith. But even this man, who in the end received double of more than everything that he even started out with, Job was given so much more than he could handle that he said these things. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed his day. And Job spake it and said, let the day perish wherein I was born, and that night in which I was, it was said, there is a man child conceived. Let that day be darkness. Let not God regard it from above, neither the light shine upon it. Um, he's saying, let them curse it that curse the day who are ready to raise up their morning. You know, he, he's saying, why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? You know, he's he's saying that it would be, it'd be better for him not to have even been born. That's how much Job was given more than he could handle. Let me let me share my screen again. We're back at First uh, Corinthians chapter uh, one, verse eight, and we're going to go to we're going to look at verse nine, the very next verse. This is after he says, we were pressed out of measure and above strength in so much as we despaired even of life. He then says, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raises the dead. So when somebody says, you know, uh, God will never give you more than you can handle. What I would say is that God will give you more than you can handle. He doesn't expect you to handle it. He expects you to lay it at his feet and for him to handle it, for you to allow him to handle it, for you to demonstrate your faith by giving it over to him and trusting him to handle it in his strength. So when you're going through something that's Terribly difficult. Bad weather. You lose your job. You uh, inflation, wars, divorce, whatever. You're. We're not expected to handle these things in our strength. We're expected to handle these things in his strength. Um, in in uh, Philippians four thirteen. Um, let's just go there, since this is a Bible study. Um, What did I say? Philippians? I did. Let's see. Where is it? That's New Testament, right? Okay, here we go. Yeah. Philippians 4.13. So he says, I can do all things, what? Through Christ, who strengthens, strengthens me. King James. It, you, he's not saying he can do all things. He's saying he can do all things through Christ. So all these things that we're, we're asked to, to suffer and endure, these, we're, in, we're not enduring these things of ourselves. We're enduring these things through Christ. Through Christ's strength is who gets us through these things. And in doing so, we're actually demonstrating our faith. This is the, this is the tangible the tangibility of that faith is us re relying on the strength of Christ and trusting Christ to carry these things. So if, if you feel like 
God has singled you out. He just may have, just like Job, where he was bragging on Job. Hey, uh, look at my servant Job. And, and what does Satan say? Satan says, well, yeah, take away all of his stuff and he will curse you. But what happens instead? He, Job demonstrates his faith and becomes a, a, a great example of letting Christ carry these things for us. There's numerous, numerous examples of God's chosen people. These are the people that are the storied characters of his word. Uh, Jacob, you know, Jacob got swindled on a, on a contract. Joseph, imprisoned for 20 years, you know, uh, 13 years, and then he had the seven years of where, where he was running the, um, the, the famine. Um, you have David. His son tried to assassinate him. Um, you had Elijah, who was out in the wilderness journey, being sought for execution, being fed by ravens. You had Jonah. Jonah thrown overboard um, because of his issues. But, uh, you know, I, I want to point also to Christ. Christ said to take up your cross and follow him. Christ was the perfect example of laying down our life and how to handle suffering. He went, he went quietly and, and into, into, that, into that suffering. Why? Because there was something to, to endure. Um, and just a couple other ones. You had Stephen stoned to death. You had Paul was executed after being marooned on an island full of snakes. These men suffered greatly. And um, so we, we are in good company when we, we go through these. Okay. Now, back to... Um, first Corinthians here. Um, so if we go back, or I'm sorry, second Corinthians chapter one, um, there's a word in here that I want to bring to your attention, uh, when, when he's talking about this suffering and this, this word appears in, uh, verse nine and it's, um, it's actually talking about the consolation. Um, hold on, I might have my reference wrong here. Second one eight. The constellation. And if you if you look at what that word means, um hold on, I gotta find the right reference for this. He was verse six. Is it? Okay. Six verse six. Verse six. Uh wow. Yeah, yeah, there it is. G thirty eight seventy four. And if you scroll down here, it it comes from G thirty eight seventy. And and if you hold your cursor over there, hopefully you can see that uh, on the screen. It says uh, to call near. That is invite or invoke. To beseech, to call for, to comfort. Desire, exhort, entreat, and pray. So, uh, in in this context, it says, "And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so shall you also, so shall be, so shall you be also of the consolation." It's an invitation, and and basically, what it's conveying here is that. Because you have suffered these things, you you can partake in in ministering to other people that have suffered similar things. It's an invitation to participate in the demonstration of your faith. Um, so I would ask this: If I don't know how many of you have children, or if you know of a child anywhere in the world. Uh, think about that child. If that child were to come to their parents and say, you know what? Um, I just don't want to go to school anymore. Um, I, I just don't like it. Yeah, I, I don't like the, the suffering 
that I have at school and, and all the hard learning and figuring things out. You, you wouldn't, no good parent would allow them to just not ever go to school or training anymore. Why? Because they know that they know that it's good for them. They know it, it's going to uh, make them a better person, a stronger person, right? Um, and that's much of like what we go through. And I know that you know over the many years, uh, I've desired for Christ to come and say, "Let's let's all just get out of here. Let's go. Let's start our eternity in perfection." and and everything else. But I know these last years have been um, instrumental in making me stronger, in making me more ready to lay down my suffering at his feet and trust him to carry it for me, to give me the strength to get through anything. Um, and, and that's, uh, you know, he says in Romans 8.37 that we're, we're conquerors through him, through him that loved us. And so it's because he loves us that we get this opportunity. So, and what is this opportunity? This opportunity is, is what we're going through right now. Um, there was a time in my life when I was deceived into thinking that, that we're here to achieve some perfection on this earth that somehow we can achieve the perfect career, the perfect job, the the perfect husband or wife, or we can raise perfect kids that they all get 4.0 grade point averages and and full ride athletic scholarships and 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 all of these things. But this is deception. This this world that we're walking through, this is not our reward. Our reward is in his kingdom that is coming. We are in this world demonstrating our faith. And, you know, if God did take away all of our suffering, where would be, where would the demonstration of faith be? It would become simple words. Yeah, God, I believe you and I trust you, yada, 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 whatever, whatever, whatever. But because we're going through this, we are we're tangibly demonstrating our faith. And so, um, so I wanted to point that out. But also, um, I wanted to discuss briefly, where does a saying like this come from? God won't give you more than you can handle. And then it gets passed around and, and said so often that, I would venture to say that many people think it's probably in the Bible. Um, and, and I guess it's, it's, it's like many of those things that are, they're idioms of Christendom that are nowhere in the truth of God's word, but they get said enough times that they, they're, they're really a poor substitute for truth. And there's many examples of this. I won't get into all of them because I could probably offend everybody in this room at some point or another, pointing out some of these things that are just said over and over again in Pharisee school, and uh, and and then they become just part of the what people believe is actually true. And um, but I'm sure if you think really hard, you can uh, you can think of some examples of things that you thought were true that ended up not being at all true. They were just part of the Christendom, grab it and grab it, say it enough times, and and, uh, and people believe it's true. So um, so that's all I'll say about that. But um, that's really all I have. I, I hope this, uh, this was able to, to bless you at least to some degree. And uh, I just want to open it up to uh, conversation at this point. That was awesome. Amen. Thank you so much.
Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much, brother. That was so encouraging and very well put and very timely for myself individually and I'm sure for everybody else. So thank you and God bless you. Amen. Yes, thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you, brother. I mean Thank you, Brother Amish. I appreciate that. Uh, great message. Uh, very well put. And uh, something that we seem to forget like on a daily basis, but uh, you really put it in perspective. Uh, definitely how we have our suffering is, is in Christ, but it's uh, it's something that we put on his his feet under his and we, we take it we take it as the cross, but um, but it's within he gives us the strength to get through. You know, I've, I've said this before, and I just want to repeat it, that that someday, very soon, uh, the, and, and I won't venture to guess a date or a, an hour or whatever, but very soon, uh, we're going to be standing on the other side of this snare that comes upon the whole world. And when that happens, our ability to demonstrate our faith will be over. Because once you see the thing, you, you can no longer have faith in it. It just becomes, you know, fact that, that, that you've seen. So I would encourage all of you to enjoy this opportunity to demonstrate that faith, because once that happens from that point for all of eternity, you will never have an opportunity to demonstrate your faith like you have right now. Amen. So uh, the Lord's perfect sacrifice um, did pave the way. It, it took us out of the covenant of law and in, into the covenant of grace. And, and, and what that did is that allowed us to repent for our sins um, and took us out of just damnation um, where the wages, you know, under the covenant of law, the wages of sin is death. Uh, covenant of grace brings us into, uh, you know, the ability to use our free will to repent. So like you were saying at the very end, you know, our work is not done. It gets harder. You, you know, we go from, you know, from, uh, from glory to glory. So it means like we go from plateau to plateau. And in between each plateau is a, is a pretty hefty hill to climb. Um, so even though the Lord has paved the way and paid the price for death, uh, we still have the duty to repent for our sins and go to come to him clean. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. But let me let me just clarify one thing. Uh, we, so we are not paying the price. The price is already paid. When, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I meant duty. We have the when, duty to repent. And his, he, Christ said that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And so... These are these are opportunities. So it rains on the just and the unjust alike. What we have that is the blessing is we know where we are going to be for eternity. And so as we go through these sufferings, we are able to call on the strength of Christ who strengthens us to endure anything. And and we can do it joyfully because we know ultimately where we're going to, to to end up, and and not even death can hold us. That's why uh, when I when I started this conversation about you know things that are too hard too much to handle, like you know cancer and cheating spouses and 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 you know prodigal children and all of these these things, the just and the unjust experience these same things. What we have is we have the strength of Christ, and we know that no matter what we go through for eternity, we, we, have, we will be fully redeemed in eternity. And so we're not really paying a price. It's really, it's really a blessing that we're able to endure all things through the strength of Christ. Amen, brother. Amen. That's his grace that does that for us. Right. That's what that's what true grace means, right? That's that's not uh it's not the hyper grace, it's it's the grace of of Jesus to to help us endure those things that come our, in our way. 
Right. And, and all of those things that we end up going through, he turns for good and, and end up becoming a blessing for us. Basically, what we were seeing is this other example of that kind of 21-year timeline playing out. <laughs> okay, so in the conversation, we were, um, it kind of started out like what it's going to be like with people um, in the new heaven, new earth, and like, you know, it was a question about the ones who are outside of the city or whatever, and, like, where some of these verses were on the timeline. So that's kind of how we end up looking at this. And then Shy, I think it was, noticed the um, times that Jesus says, I come quickly. So that's kind of what led to this. We started looking at it. Um, <clears throat> and it was, for these first five verses, it's curious because chapter 21 is where it's it's talking about how things are in the new heaven, new earth, and verses one through five seem to be this continuation of that part of the discussion. And then six and seven, it's a break where it changes. So it was curious, why was verses one through five not just, um, you know, part of the previous chapter? And I think it's because the Holy Spirit, as far as we can tell, arranged it for the verses kind of to the timeline years would match up for us. Um, at least in the, in the, you know, our, our 21 year timeline viewpoint. So those first five verses, once again, are they're just uh, tag on to what's happening in the, in the new heaven, new earth, as far as content, but purpose wise, it gives us the right alignment for the 21 year timeline. So then you get to chapter, or verses 6 and 7. And he said to me, these things are faithful and true. And Lord God, of holy prophet, sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. And here's where it was. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. So when you compare verses 6 and 7, or um, especially 6, to Revelation 1, it's like restating it. So um, kind of this indication that there's um, a, new, a new beginning. And then um, behold, that's specifically that instruction to watch. So, you know, in thinking about the, if there's the 40 days of Son of Man, that he's coming quickly there. Um, and that this is stated in like the year seven, end of the the good seven years or whatever, the easy seven years. Um, it, it's the it's the time to start looking that he's going to be coming, and then the term you know you see blessed connect. I think that's the pre trib escape, and you see these phrases combined in this one verse. Because we've got it at like that same time. Whereas yeah, the verbiage is very interesting. It goes back and forth with the verbiage. With, with the, I'm sorry, with the tense. Mm -hmm. Like a, a, as far as present tense, then they're talking about before that, there was, it's like given a history of it, there was a uh, tree of yeah. life. Um, and then behold is like a, a present tense uh, command. Um, it's showing that there's different times that are, that are hidden within these verses. There's a structure. This is interesting because this, uh, this is almost laid out like 2 Corinthians 12. So yeah. there's, there's three times he says he's coming. And there's seven verses in between each time. Right. I was going to say, so you notice how it's behold, I come quickly, that's the warning, and blessed is right connected in that verse. When you see it 
the verses later for verse 12. And behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me. Notice that the the blessing is listed for that 14th year. So behold, I come quickly because that's the warning. He's going to be there. Like this year, five, the fifth year of the, you know, the, the seven coming up. He would be coming for the sixth seal, verse 13. Um, you know, because he's coming on Mount Zion with the... Um, father and and um you know the coming down or whatever but then blessed here in 14 because the mid-trib multitude rapture isn't until that 14th so so that's why the you've got the behold come quickly and then it's blessed is separate compared to your first one with behold and the blessed right away um Okay, so get to verse 8. So this will be like the beginning of really our 14 trib timeline. Um, Name John, him stating his name, uh, meaning favored. And people hearing and seeing the events, these things. So at that time, people have seen the escape happen and the seals are starting to open. So... Has the 40 days happened? You got the beginning of Red Horse Rider, nation versus nation. Um, say it to me, see thou, I am thy fellow servant. Uh, the prophets, because you've got the workers that are starting to, you know, share and, and convert the trib saints. Um, I thought this was interesting in verse 10 is when he's saying, seal not the sayings. Well, because seal, not specifically, it's the time of the seal judgments are opened. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that was filthy, let him be filthy still. Okay, so there's this difference between those who are continuing in, in sin and choosing the mark of the beast versus those who have now cleansed their robes in the blood to, you know, we've study the word Laban to whiten <laughs> um, and connection to the, the multitude. Because um, this is this is right on time for the mark of the beast to be starting to be enforced in and such. And then as you know, I pointed out earlier, the behold, I come quickly. So it's starting to be time to look because he's going to be coming on Mount Zion for that six seal time and then blessed uh, the tree of life reference as to the paradise because the, the one's going, um, the multitude rapture is going to paradise. Mm-hmm. And then I think get mention of the gates of the city because now they're going to be starting to rebuild that temple. Um, so you see, I had those notes here. Okay. Uh, verse 15, the dogs are without sources, whoremongers. Um, cause at that time, despite the, they had the battle and the AC and Antichrist was cast into the pit. You still have those other Kings that were around and the false prophets still running amok. angel to testify so the time of the two witnesses going out and the mention of the being the offspring of david because i think this is when he's meeting their the you know jewish expectation of messiah ben david um the spirit and the bride say come but if, if messiah gets cut off then he's not down there on earth with them anymore he's He's now up, um, and they're going to be, you know, it's that prep time for when he will descend on the Mount of Olives. There's mention of plagues, um, the AC coming out of the pit. I still wonder about, you know, the vile uh, judgments and how those line up. Um, But then, okay, we get back to verse 20. Once again, it's I come quickly, but notice there's not the uh, behold, not to look. He's surely I come quickly. Um, 
because he's coming there with the the sixth trumpet and there's no mention of blessed is he or whatever because this is not the escape rapture group anymore this is the beginning you know they're going to he's speaking now to the ones who are going to go into the millennial reign and then verse 21 grace of our lord just be with you all so because he's he's actually feet down mount of olives and present and they're going to start cleaning up things for the, the millennial reign to start You do the plus okay. sign to make your text bigger. Yeah, there we go. What was the verse you were keying in on again? Uh, I was looking at, I think it was verse, um, the verse eight, where he says, I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard them and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel. Remember when he fell down at the feet of the angel and the angel said, no, 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 don't worship me. You you know we worship Christ. We don't uh, we don't worship the angels. So that's um, right. Is, is that the, uh, I'm trying? Is that Revelation chapter one that he says that in? Well, I, I think it's five when he's. I think it's five because they couldn't find anyone to open the scroll, right? And so was it, it or was it did, four? He he did it nineteen ten too. Yeah, and I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See, thou do it not. Uh, but there's no denying the timeline, though, though, is the point that, you know, when you see in these earlier verses, when he says that he's seeing them face to face, it's almost like him being, uh, that could be one of two things. That could have been his, the, 2,000 years ago when he was here, or it could be the 40 days when, when he's here. Um, could be either one of those, right? When he says here, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in the forehead. Yeah, so it was just, um, I thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> Another uh, kind of outline of the 21 years. If If you look at it, lined up there <laughs> oh i'm definitely gonna have to go back through here and do a slow crawl through this yeah in fact he says that he, he says the same thing here that he said in 1910 see do it not do it thou do thou see thou do it not i thought verse 10 was interesting too and he saith unto me seal not the sayings of this prophecy of this book for the time is at hand so they were sealed and now he's saying seal not or another, you know, and open the seals. It's really cool timing. But he definitely got three events going on there. So, so do you think that Revelation 22 is like a synopsis of all of uh, Revelation? In a sequential, maybe, timeline? I think it's the same kind of thing that we see with a lot of the same pattern being repeated again and again like where you have uh first corinthians and second corinthians uh first uh thessalonians and second thessalonians you know you have um isaiah chapter five and chapter six there it's just a replay of seals and trumpets seals and trumpets seals and trumpets seals and trumpets Hey, Jamie, did you mention that um, here in verse 17 where it talks about the spirit and the bride? Um, not really. Just I said, you know, they're, they're mentioning the spirit and the bride and the ones up on paradise because, you know, Messiah had been cut off at that time. So, so here he says, and I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches um and then here he says and and the spirit and the bride say come so it's almost like the spirit 
and the bride are together and um, at least in this part of the timeline. Totally. Yes, totally. Yeah, totally. You know, and it's like it's the spirit and the bride giving the instruction of of come. They were the first group who who came to the Lord. Next, you have let him hear that heareth say come, like those who then heard and saw, you know, and became the tribulation saints multitude rapture. Because now they're there too. They're like come, and then finally those who are a thirsting. It can come, you know what I mean? Like, th this is now their time, because uh, I think, you know, with the trumpets, the sun had been scorching, and they're they're lacking water, you know what I mean? In fact, that, that's what they can now get, is the, the water of life. So it's this is like the message at the, the trumpets time frame for that, that last group to, to hear from the bride and the spirit. And, you know, they're in encouraging them, come on, and... <laughs> Multitude Rapture is now there saying, come on. <laughs> well, isn't that also the group, if they go through trumpets, isn't that where two-thirds of the water is turned to blood or something like that? Or there's no oh. fresh water if we go into, um, oh, I'm in the wrong book here. Um, is that Wormwood? Is it seven? Yeah, it's wor Wormwood and a third of the trees and the waters. Um so it, it, what's interesting is it works on multiple levels. Mm -hmm. yeah. It works on a spiritual level, but it also, you know, these are the people, uh, they shall hunger and no more thirst anymore. Um, the lamb, which is in their midst. And then we get into seventh seal, smoke, sensor, earthquake. Creatures that were in the sea, wormwood. Um, yeah, so they're going to be thirsty physically and spiritually. Yeah. It's like, here, we're looking at it again, and we're finding more new little bits. <laughs> we didn't even exhaust the study uh, the other day there. <laughs> Remember when we used to do this every day? I know. I miss those days. Yeah, me too. Hey, Brother Shy is in here now. Yay! Okay, now he has to teach it over again himself. <laughs> we were just talking about your study, uh, Brother Shy. Yeah, yeah. You, you were on fire, man. You were pulling nuggets out of this thing like... Yeah, you were on fire. Nice. Thanks for thanks for having me tonight. I gotta I gotta run and go collect my kid. I sure appreciate it. Thanks for kickstarting my teaching thing again. It's been a while. Well, well thank you, for your time, brother. It was great. Have a great thank evening. you, brother Amish. Thank you, brother Amish. Right, we'll do it again soon. All right, love you guys. Bye. Bye.